Hello, I'm Dr. Eugenia Cheng, and I'm the author of The Joy of Abstraction. I am a mathematician and I am a category theorist. And this book is about my research field, category theory, but for a very wide audience. I got my PhD in category theory from the University of Cambridge. And then I taught at the universities of Cambridge, Chicago, Nice and Sheffield before taking an unusual turn in my career. And now I teach art students at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I write general audience books. I do a lot of public speaking and outreach and general popularization of maths. I was inspired to write The Joy of Abstraction because I really believe that category theory is something many people can learn without having to go through all the usual steps of a formal maths education. And I was inspired by this after writing my first book, which was How to Bake Pie. That book had an original title in England, which was Cakes, Custard and category theory. And I actually introduced category theory to a completely general audience of people who may not know, remember any maths at all, and who might actually be afraid of maths, traumatized by maths, think that they're not maths people, not that that's really a thing. But I introduced it at the level of ideas to show what the ideas behind category theory are. And usually the received wisdom in mathematics has been that you have to go through your whole undergraduate career and learn all these other branches of maths before you can do category theory. But I found, and I've always believed, that you don't really have to do that, at least in order to get the ideas. And then after that, a lot of people wrote to me and said to me, oh, I really want to know more category theory now. I really want to go further. And the thing is that there weren't really any books that would do that because there are textbooks aimed at graduate students. And now there are a few textbooks also aimed at upper level undergraduate students. And although they don't have a lot of prerequisites technically, they do read like formal maths textbooks, which is to say that they say theorem, you know, definition, theorem, proof, definition, theorem, proof, exercise. And if that's not the level that you're at or not the kind of thing you're into, it's just very impenetrable, even though technically they don't rely on any actual maths background. It's that way of reading and writing a textbook that makes it difficult for people who don't have math degrees. And so I thought, well, I would like to write a book that bridges that gap basically between how to bake pie and a normal math textbook. And in the last, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, there has been this amazing growth of interest in category theory from people who aren't actually mathematicians, but who are maybe adjacent to mathematics. So scientists, computer scientists have always been interested in category theory, but scientists, maybe people in engineering, biology, uh, maybe even people in business, linguistics, people who see that that abstract framework can be helpful to, to them, but they just don't have a way of getting in to the technicality of it. You know, the ideas are very clear, and it's clear that it could help people in some way, but the technicalities were just, there's no way to get in. And many people told me that they bought these other books and kind of got halfway through the first chapter and then just couldn't, couldn't do it. So I thought, well, I would like to write a book that really gradually ramps up to that formality. So it does get formal in the end, but still with tons and tons of explanation. But the entire first part of the book is just a gentle build up to how we do formalism in mathematics at all and why we use this notation and how to read it and how to read a book like that. And I actually don't even get to the definition of a category until chapter eight. I read, looked at loads of other books on category theory that are quite gentle, but they usually give the definition of a category on page one. <laughs> and so I decided, that, and someone wrote to me after reading a draft and said, seems to take a really long time to get to the first definition. I said, yes, that's the whole point. If you want to start with the definition, you can read another book. But if that's too much, then this one will really gradually go in. So that's what inspired me to write it. The joy of abstraction could be for a very wide range of people, I think, that and basically anyone who wants to learn some more formal category theory, 
without having a mathematical background. But more specifically, that could be people with degrees in other things other than maths who want to get into category theory. So it could be those researchers. It could be uh, adults who once had a degree in maths ages ago and feel like reading some more maths that's a bit more formal and contemporary than a lot of popular maths books that are for a completely wide audience. It could also be for high school students and secondary school students who feel a pull towards abstract maths and want to read a book that will show them, point them in the direction of higher level maths, just they haven't got to it yet. It could also be for school students who really like abstract maths more than the kind of endless calculations that you do in school maths. It could also be for math teachers who would like to enrich their knowledge of maths because they quite likely didn't do category theory in whatever degree they did, either because in those days it just wasn't part of an under, undergraduate degree, or if they don't specifically have that kind of maths degree, then maybe they would like to enrich their understanding and find things that they could then do with school students because the, I wrote it also to be something that could in the future be used as a textbook in school, I think, because certainly in America, most extension maths in high school is always calculus, 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 calculus. And I think that there are other possibilities, including category theory, because it doesn't really depend on any earlier things. It doesn't depend on being good at manipulating algebra or solving equations or anything. So it could also be for people who are homeschooling. It could be for people who've kind of reached the limit of their school math syllabus and want to do some more. It could be for people who have retired and want to just keep their brain active in doing something that's a little more interactive than just reading a book where information comes at you because then you can think about things and expand your knowledge. And it could also it could also be for uh, the the families of category theorists if they want to see more about what category theorists do. So there's a whole a whole range of people who I was thinking of, but it could also actually be for undergraduates and graduate students who are can read formal textbooks but want something to help them along showing more of the ideas behind it because formal textbooks tend to say you know definition theorem proof and then they show you the the finished result without necessarily uncovering and unveiling the thought processes that went behind it and how it's supposed to feel as you do it and how you could come up with these things yourself and how you could come up with these proofs and what we feel when we're doing it those kinds of things and i have a friend who always likes to learn he's an actual mathematician who likes to learn math with two books that take different points of view and so i think this could be something that even people who are quite serious about math use alongside a more formal textbook to to give them the ideas and also to get ideas about how to talk about category theory to non-mathematicians themselves and so i think in that sense it could also be for actual category theorists to help them see how we can talk about category theory to a wide audience and especially to relate it to things in life that people care about such as social justice and politics and so on This book is definitely different from my other books that are for a really, really, really general audience because it the aim really is to get into formal category theory rigorously. Whereas my other books show a little bit of that, but it's really more like just showing the ideas behind maths and show, telling stories around maths and saying what the point is about maths rather than now you are going to be able to do category theory. And so when I wrote How to Bake Pie, I wanted to show everybody how wonderful category theory is and what, what it's for, but I wasn't under any illusions that this book could turn anyone into someone who could do category theory. And I think that there, there's a, a kind of balance there because it's not that everyone should be able to do category theory, and I'm not claiming that everyone should be able to do all of mathematics. And there's definitely value in just being able to appreciate mathematics, like we can appreciate music even if we can't play music, or we can appreciate art even if we can't make art, and we can go and eat food in a restaurant even if we don't know how to make it. And so this book 
has a little bit of that because I still think it's important, it's of value to be able to appreciate rigorous mathematical arguments, even if you can't produce research yourself. And that's the thing, that there could be many people who are interested in being able to appreciate those rigorous arguments, even if you aren't going to develop category theory as a researcher yourself. If you want to use the arguments rigorously, then you need to be able to follow those things. And if you want to be able to read other things in category theory, you want to be able to follow those things. And so th this book is definitely something that will help people be able to read other category theory textbooks. And so it, the, the aim really was to bridge into that. Now, it's still it's still appropriate, even if you never think you'll want to read a category theory textbook in your life. But that 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 is definitely one of the aims, which is not at all the case for any of my really wide audience books. You definitely don't need to know category theory before reading this book, because that's the whole point of book. And it may help if you've read How to Bake Pie to, to see what the idea is in the first place. But I do motivate it entirely from scratch in this book. Category theory is what might be thought of as very abstract mathematics. And so abstract mathematics has become more abstract in the last 100 years or so. And category theory is a very contemporary branch of maths compared with the rest of maths anyway. So it, it grew up in the middle of the 20th century. But since then, it has really transformed the way that pure maths is done. And it's a kind of unifying principle. So it's like a meta form of mathematics that does for mathematics what mathematics does for everything else. So I often like to say it's the mathematics of mathematics. And so what does mathematics do at all in the world? Well, it unifies different aspects of basically science, the scientific world. It shows us how things are connected, how we can extract a logical part from the center of things in order to be able to, to study a lot of different things at once before putting the details back in. So we can say, oh, we don't have to do make these arguments repeatedly in different places. Like we don't have to go one banana plus one banana is two bananas and one apple plus one apple is two apples and one cookie plus two cookies. We can go, ah, oh, one plus one things is two and now we can apply it to all the different situations. So that's what maths does in general for the world. So category theory does that for maths. And so what it does is it goes, oh, wait, this mathematical construction in that field is awfully similar to this other mathematical construction in this other field, which is awfully similar to that other one. So why don't we do it one time instead of doing it all these different times? And then we can put the details back in in those different situations. And so in that sense, it's really about making connections between different things. I love making connections between things. But because it does it so abstractly, what I realized over the last well, over the course of my career, I suppose, is that that feels like it takes you very far from real life. But actually, because it's so abstract, it enables us to bring in more of real life. Because if you do less abstract math, then you can apply it to things like, you know, flying a plane or building a bridge or say a differential equation. That's something that is really important to engineering and to medicine and to things where you're studying fluid flow or gas flows or buildings or something and electricity. Um, but it doesn't really tell me that much about social justice. That I don't believe that there are that many diff that differential equations there. Whereas if you go even more abstract and in category theory, we just think about relationships between things. It's all based on how mathematical ob objects relate to other ones in different contexts. And that's the entire world. The whole world is about how different things relate to other things in different contexts. And so to me, that makes it more widely applicable, actually. And that's what, that's, that is what the joy of abstraction is to me. It's quite odd and a bit off the wall in a way for me to say we can apply category theory to everyday life. But I realize that I just do. And that this is it's partly that when you spend a lot of time thinking about something, you just end up seeing it everywhere. It's like if you stare really hard at a particular uh, structure, you'll just start seeing it all over the place. But I also realized that my training and discipline in category theory was is really helping me understand everything 
in the world, whether it's how I need to organize my day, my interactions with friends, um, issues in the workplace or with my job or just the arguments that people have on the Internet. <gasps> people have arguments on the Internet and sometimes people say, oh, I just don't understand how somebody could say such and such a thing. And I always think to myself quietly, but I do understand why people say those things. And I don't I don't know how we can change the world. Like it's not a magic wand that's going to fix the world, but it does enable me to understand the world around me better. And there was this one a public event I did that was called Mathematics in Life and there were a bunch of speakers and they all spoke about amazing aspects of applied maths in the world and I spoke about category theory and at the end someone in the audience said I would like wanted to ask all of us how we use our research in our daily lives and all the applied mathematicians said oh well mm, I suppose I don't really exactly use it in my daily life it's more the principles of mathematical thinking that I use in my daily life and I said I use my research in my daily life because the principles of mathematical thinking, that is my research. That's what category theory is. It's like taking all the principles of mathematical thinking and making them into a branch of mathematics yourself. And because it's all about understanding relationships between things and then how those relationships interact and how that gives us a context for understanding objects. That is how I understand the world all the time, because it's all about understanding how something got to the way it is in this particular context. And so whether it's, you know, things like people's different experiences of life and the thing that is sometimes called affirmative action, although I don't think that's a very good word, because what it means is that we shouldn't just look at where people are in life, and what they have achieved in absolute we should put it in context and say well what was their life even like before that what context have they been in what forces have been opposing them in their progress and what forces have been pushing them along just like if you watch somebody rowing up a river you might think they're working really hard and not getting anywhere if you don't realize that the current's completely going against them all the time and so if the current of life is totally going against someone then they're going to have to work much harder to get anywhere and we should take that into account and so that is something that i think abstract mathematics deep down because it shows us examples where that happens abstractly we can go oh yeah that's like when people have really struggled against oppression and discrimination for their whole lives and then there's things like how the interactions between people with different types of privilege happen, which I've understood through this thing called partially ordered sets. A partially ordered set is a particular kind of category that I can draw diagrams of that help me understand why there's so much antagonism about different kinds of privilege. So that's another thing that's in the book. And so these are all ways of thinking that because I've practiced those ways of thinking in the mathematical realm, it's very smooth. I don't want to say natural because it's not like it's biological or innate. It's just because I've practiced it a lot, it happens very easily for me to use those ways of thinking to see something that's going on in the world. Like that we, that if we think about gray areas in math, because we, we think about patching together very, very small increments of things to get something far apart, then if we forget that we've patched them together, things just seem really far apart. But then we realize that we can use very small increments to patch them together so that when two people seem to be violently disagreeing with each other, it may be possible actually to see that there is some sense in which there's a path between them patched together by the little parts. And in a way, these are not these are not really deep applications of category theory that would win a research prize or something. It's a way of thinking that uh, aligns my brain in such a way that I can have methods for thinking more clearly through things that seem extremely complicated in the world. And in the end, that's what math is for. It's to give us techniques for thinking through extremely complicated situations. I do think that times tables are kind of pointless, that, that they're a stick to beat people with and they're used to filter out people who are supposedly good at maths and, and maybe not good at maths. And in fact, my amazing PhD supervisor, the great category theorist Martin Highland, told me this amazing story, which is that when he was eight at school, his class had a thing where they had to do timed multiplication table tests every day. And 
if they got everything right three days in a row, they didn't have to do it anymore. They were considered to have achieved the standard. And guess what? He was the only child in the class who never achieved it. And then he became one of the world's greatest ever category theorists and a professor at the University of Cambridge. And so that tells me something. Well, I think it's a it's a it's a great anecdote, but it's a to me it's showing that times tables and abstract mathematics have really nothing to do with each other. You can be good at both or you can be good at neither or you can be good at one and not the other. And definitely times tables are not an indicator of whether you will be good at high level mathematics and nor is any of the rest of school math really. And so one of the things, another thing that I, uh, I wish is that we had had more things explained to us where they came from because it took me a really long time to understand that things are there for a reason and it's not just here but follow this rule and the thing is that I was okay at doing that because I found it interesting things like the definitions of sine and cosine like sine equals opposite over adjacent so you just kind of wrote memorize that but but there's a reason for it and it's about relationships between things and that's why category theory is kind of all pervasive because everything is about relationships between things and understanding that equations aren't facts they're also relationships and that in category theory instead of saying this thing is equal to this thing or this isn't we go here's a sense in which these things are equal and here's this other sense in which these things aren't equal and the interaction between those different senses is what is interesting about the situation and then category theory gives us a way of having more nuanced and subtle choices that we can make about what counts as the same and what doesn't count as the same in different senses and so I wish that school math had more of that sense of there are choices involved and we've made these choices because they help us you can try making these other choices and see how they help of course that that would be a much slower way of learning maths but you know slow maths is good and there's way too much emphasis on doing things fast at school and the people who do things the fastest are not getting deeply into it and so the joy of abstraction is quite long as a book but it's not very fast and so it I, and I don't mean to sound this I, I want to say this in a positive way but it doesn't cover very much it, it takes a really really large number of pages but the point is that I go very slowly through explaining where things came from and how we do things so that although what I mean is you can read it much faster than a normal textbook because normal textbooks go so fast that you might have to spend a month thinking about one paragraph or a year or there are some books where I've been thinking about the same paragraph for 20 years and I still don't understand it and so I wanted this to be a book that actually walks through all those steps of understanding kind of slowly and so I I do I do understand that it wouldn't have been possible to do category theory at school back when I was at school because we hadn't got to that point yet but I think it's now getting to the point where it could be possible and so I wrote this book to try and edge us along towards that and I would love it if there are a few teachers who have started talking to me about maybe doing it a little bit with the pupils and I think that that the key is that you don't have to be an expert in category theory to do it in school with students because yeah you wouldn't be able to do it at an extremely high level of rigor but nothing at school is done at an extremely high level of rigor anyway and I wrote the book to be there as the help so that everyone can do it together even if you're not an expert so in the end I know that we couldn't have done category theory at school in my day but I hope it will be soon I love teaching abstract math to art students because my students at the School of the Art Institute are very, very deep thinking art students. And so they love thinking abstractly. They love the fact that abstract math is about patterns in ideas and that they can then use it to think about the whole of their life. And I make sure I bring in the whole of the rest of their life while I'm teaching it. And, and that's why that although the joy of abstraction is a lot more rigorous and formal than what I teach to my art students, a lot of the ideas for how to relate it to life came from teaching art students because I realized that if you don't 
relate maths to things that people care about, then they won't care about maths either. So some people care about maths just because they do. I never needed it to be related to life because I just loved it the way it was. I just loved messing around with formality and putting jigsaw puzzles together. That's me. I didn't, I didn't need that, but I'm not everybody else, it turns out. And so there are loads of people who, so everyone always says, oh, you have to relate it to real life. And so then you get some kind of thing saying, you know, you have 16 watermelons and you eat three of them. It's like that doesn't actually relate it to real life. It's really contrived. Whereas things that people already care about. And so there are so many people who really, the thing that they, they just care about issues in the world, about fairness and equality and justice and equity and politics and then those things have often been kept out of maths in the past. The traditional view is to say maths should be politically neutral. And when I first started teaching, I thought that too, but that's because that's how I'd always been taught. And then while teaching my art students, I gradually realized that that was not the case. And it actually, I went way the other way during in the 2016 election cycle, because in the US it was just so dire. And at that point, it was, I went from thinking, oh, I shouldn't talk about politics to thinking, I have to talk about politics all the time because my students were so terrified about what was going on in the world that if I didn't refer to it, then they wouldn't be in the slightest bit interested in anything I had to say. Plus, I realized that the issues involved were such of such danger to humanity that there is no way to be neutral. There are some things about which it is not possible to be neutral. And I think that racism and rape are two things about which you cannot be neutral. If you're not doing something against it, then then you're basically, you're allowing it to continue. And so sometimes people say to me, oh, aren't you worried that if you talk about social justice in abstract math, you'll put off people who aren't interested in social justice. And it's funny because I spent the whole rest of my career not talking about social justice in math. And no one ever said to me, oh, aren't you worried that you'll put off people who care about social justice? And so if people don't care about social justice, there's hundreds of thousands of millions of other math books that they can read that don't talk about social justice. So that's fine. Whereas for people who do care about it, who've been put off math because they think it doesn't touch or it does, it's it's so far removed, it's just all about balls flying through the air. It doesn't it doesn't help them with the things they really care about. This book is for them because I show that it can help us think about all the things that you care about. And that is something that I've really learned from teaching art students. The main takeaway I would like readers to have is that category theory can be for everybody at some level. And whether that's at the level where you appreciate the ideas behind it, because you can use the ideas behind it in daily life, even if you don't understand or do the formality. So there's that, or that there is a way in to be able to do the formality as well, or that you're a mathematician and you use it, or you're going to be a researcher in category theory. So whatever level, there is something in category theory for everyone.